Today, we're going to start a series of sermons, Room, Room for You this Christmas. And we're going to look at uh, five characters. There are many more than five, but we're just going to look at five characters and today uh, in the Christmas story and look at their lives and how they were included into the Christmas story. Do you know and realize that in the plan of God, we are not always aware when we're included? Sometimes we're included and we don't even know it. And you may be one of those people right now today. You may be trying to figure out, where's my life headed? What's going on? What's the plan of God? I'm, I, I've been trying to serve the Lord faithfully. I want to encourage you, faithful service to the Lord includes yourself in the plans of the Lord. Now, you might not know what those plans are. You might not know how they're unfolding. You may even be looking around you and think, what's happening in my life and what's happening in this world? And how can this be the plan of God? But the answer to it is God has a plan. And he is at work, even when we don't recognize it or see it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. And when the time, right time came. I want to pause. The right time. What's the right time? The right time is God's time. It's his time. And so when the right time came, not, not necessarily the time the people wanted, not necessarily in the way the people wanted it, but the right time, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman and subject to the law. So we see here the unfolding of the Christmas account, the Christmas story, and the inclusion of our first character we're going to look at today, Mary. Mary was included in the Christmas story in ways she never anticipated. Scripture speaks of Mary. Mary knew these scriptures, but she may not have realized, in fact, I'm confident she did not realize, these scriptures spoke about her. And this is the, uh, a fascinating thing. The whole ways back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the beginning, in, in Genesis, we see Mary is included in Scripture, not by name, but she is identified, clearly identified, and it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. I'll put this division. God promised this right after the fall of mankind. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you. I'm going to bring a division again. I'm going to separate people out. And there is going to be a difference. Where Satan thought he had won the victory, God was saying, I'm going to put division between you. He doesn't even say mankind. He said woman. He's identifying Mary way back there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's not just there. Mary is spoken of in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you this sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we know this is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. But guess what? He's identifying her, a virgin. And it's not just identifying. He's pinpointing Mary here in this passage of Scripture. She's included. Isn't it fascinating to think how this must have been processed years later in her mind when she come to realize the Scripture spoke about her long before she even realized it was speaking about her. And that's also true in different ways in our lives. God is speaking into our lives. God is at work, and we may not even fully realize it. It goes on, and we continue on this account, and we kind of go through a journey here. See, we often think when God is silent, God is inactive, but that's not true. God is active, even when it appears that he is silent. Here is Mary, probably in 14, 15 years of age, in her teens. Here is Mary from a town of Nazareth. Scripture only has one thing to say about Nazareth. What good thing can come from Nazareth? Wow, you thought you grew up in a rough spot. What good thing? It's not on the major highway. It's not a, 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 a city of any significance. There's no importance. She's an ordinary young girl in an ordinary small town with no significant impact on the world stage. You see, but when God 
is silent, it does not equate to the fact that God is not working. God may be silent, but God is clearly active. And these scriptures point to the fact that long before Mary ever know, knew, long before anyone else realized that God had a plan and he was bringing that plan to pass. We see in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. This is speaking to John the Baptist. And, and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even as a messenger uh, of the covenant. And so we see the prophecy of Jesus Christ happening here. Again, we're reminded in Psalms chapter 121, verse 4, we're reminded, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. I know, some of you thought slobber or sleep when you were younger, right? He shall never slumber or sleep. He'll never not pay attention. In our life, it's important to recognize, and as we look at Christmas, as we look at this inclusion in Christmas, whether you realize it today or not, you are included in Christmas. Whether you even see anything about your life as being remotely spiritual, I want you to know something. You are included in Christmas. God is at work, and he's at work in your life. You say, well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't really even follow God. I don't even care about God. I, I'm not even paid any attention to the things of God. Note this. That's the very reason why it's called the gospel or translates good news. Well, we were not aware. Well, we are in our own life, absorbed in our own things. God is looking at us. He's observing us. He is concerned for us, and he is making a way so we do not have to stay separated from God, but that we can be connected with God. God is always watching. He's always working in our lives. Psalms 98.3 says this, uh, He hath remembered his mercy and his truth towards the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. How is this coming? This is coming through Mary. A young teenage lady born in a nothing town with no pedigree, with no background, with no prestige, with no uh, phenomenal education, with no wealth, and she's written into the story of Christmas, of the coming of the Messiah. She's included. Never think that God for one moment allows something to go without his notice. God's timing is always perfect. We may be wondering why. What, what, what's going on here? But the stage is being set. A few moments we'll read a scripture about Gabriel, Gabriel the angel speaking to Mary and talking to her about what is going to happen. And if you know the Christmas account of all, you know that Mary is number one caught off guard, but I don't think we appreciate how much she was caught off guard. Mind you, at this point in history, God has not spoken even through a prophet in over 400 years. You think of Mary's dilemma when she goes to explain her situation. What? You're with child, but you're a virgin? Physically impossible. But what is impossible for man is not impossible for God. And what? God came and spoke to you? He hasn't even spoke to a prophet in 400 years. Who do you think you are? You are, you are really out there, Mary. This is her situation. This is her scenario. This is the account. This is included in Christmas. So she has really been given a pretty heavy message here. But I want you to note something. As, as there's a seeming 400-year period of silence on God's behalf, he's still actively working. What happens in this 400-year period, period of time from Malachi to, to the uh, appearance of Gabriel with Mary? What happens during this time? Well, a guy you probably studied about in the history class comes onto the world stage. His name is Alexander the Great. 
Alexander conquers most of the known world at that time. He's Greek. His influence then in his conquest at 20 years of age, he comes to power. As his father passes away, he comes to power. And at 20 years of age, he goes out to battle and decides he's going to subjugate the world to Greece. That sets a stage. Here's the stage that is set. Guess what happens during that time? Because the world is being subjugated to Greece, the Hebrew Septuagint, the Old Testament, the Scriptures, the Pentateuch, the, the writings uh, of Moses are translated from Hebrew into Greek. Vital for the spreading of the gospel after Christ resurrects from the dead. This is also setting the stage for the Roman Empire, which would be the next world power that rises up really in the part because of Alexander the Great for Greece and the shifting. And some shifting of power took place in this 400-year period of time, and we move from Alexander the Great, and we move to Pompey, which is a Roman consulate. But he doesn't have supreme power yet, but there's something he does. He sends military troops from Rome down to Palestine, Israel, and he conquers it, and he places a ruler over Palestine called Herod the Great. He also does something else quite interesting during this time. He wants to consolidate power, and he realizes he cannot do this alone. So in, in the forming of the Rome, uh, and, and what we know as the Roman Empire, in the formation of that, he begins to consolidate power through brokered agreements. And there's three people included, uh, included in these agreements, and he's one of them. And he gets another guy into the agreement by marrying his daughter to this guy, and this guy was called Caesar Augustus. Now you see the stage being set for the birth of Jesus Christ. Caesar would go on and decree that taxes and the census be taken, Palestine or, Palestine or Israel over, taken over from, from, from Rome, and the census is taken, and Joseph and Mary have to travel to Bethlehem from Nazareth. Listen. For, for the average God-fearing Jew, there is no way in their mind, and for Mary, there's no way in her mind she could have conceived that all the craziness, like Herod the Great, he wasn't great if you were, he didn't like you. He would put you to death. He killed his own family. He killed lots and lots of people. Oh, yeah, he, he was called Herod the Great because he was a prolific builder. And he built many things, things that are standing to this day. But he did so at the blood of so many people's hands. And if he saw you as a threat, he doesn't care who you were. He doesn't care if you were his wife. He doesn't care if you were his children. He put you to death. There's nothing great about this person. So if Mary was looking at this whole scenario, you think, this guy is not good. You can understand why Mary and Joseph, when they're warned in the dream later, hey, get out of here. Here's what Herod's intentions are. You can understand why they took flight and went to Egypt. All this prophesied. You see, God is at work even when it appears he is silent. He's setting the stage. The story is not about us. The story is about his incredible redemptive grace. Not only to us, but to all mankind. And it's in this context we see the unfolding of God's grace in our lives. I want to ask you this today. The political stage was also set. Mind you, the sect of the Pharisees and Sadducees were basically two different political sects. Oh, they were religious, but they were political religion. And there was this brokering going on that was happening and taking place. Herod uh, and, and uh, was working with the Sadducees more closely. The Pharisees were more resistant. And you had this scene. And guess what? Even the fact that they would bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate, okay? And they would bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate. At that point in time, we see the division. It was all political maneuvering. But in this 400-year period of silence, the, the Christmas story is being made. 
and probably not a person knows it. Then all of a sudden, there's Mary, and an angel shows up. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a village in Galilee. So we've got an identified. Here she is. Listen, God could have visited Mary when she was in Jerusalem because they went to Jerusalem. They were faithful Jews. They would have went down there for, to the, go to the temple and make sacrifices and all the pilgrimages. They would have done all these things. In fact, we have Jesus getting lost, remember? Uh, supposedly lost uh, when they were traveling back from the festivals down in Jerusalem. But no, God bypasses the epicenter of religion at that point in time. He goes past all those things and he goes to a no-nothing town named Nazareth. Nazareth, to a teenage young lady who's not even married. And he sends Gabriel, who appears two other times in Scripture. He doesn't send Gabriel to Joseph. That's a different angel. But in this case, to Mary, he sends Gabriel. And he shows up in this village to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Emmanuel. There is no greater place and there is no greater point in the Christmas story for any one of us than the point that God is with us. That's it. Do we deserve it? No, but he is. Does it seem like he is? Well, you can be distracted. Herod's uh, governor of the province. Uh, we got Caesar taxing us. We got all kinds of battles going on. We have division within the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It may almost appear, is God even here? But the angel Gabriel speaks to it and says, you are favored of the Lord. God is with you. That is the place of inclusion that God has for everyone who would call upon his name. It's the inclusion of saying, I'm with you. He goes on elsewhere in Scripture to say, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the blessing of the Lord abiding with us. Confused and disturbed. Mind you, I set the stage for this. God hasn't spoken in 400 years. Now all of a sudden, Gabriel shows up? To me? I'd be a little confusing. And tells me I'm about to have a child? That's not biologically possible. Be a little confusing. This is Mary's situation. And Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. So she's pondering this in her heart. She's weighing all these things. And as, as I mentioned before, she's trying to figure out what, how does this work. And again, her, her situation here is quite precarious. You're expecting a child, but I'm a virgin and I'm not married. She could be stoned for this conduct. You're expecting a child, but I'm a virgin and not married. God hasn't spoken in 400 years, but God's spoken to you. Wow. She's in quite the situation. You can understand why she's a little distressed. Whew. What do you do with this? And who's going to believe her? By the way, this isn't the only tough part of the journey. Mary at this point is kind of like Job. You don't want God picking you. You do, but you don't. God picked Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Pick somebody else. Uh, can't, you can't take his life. God picks Mary. How do I explain this to my fiance? How do I explain this to my parents? How do I explain this to the religious leaders? I'm sure they're going to say, oh, yeah, right, you, Mary. 400 years we haven't heard from God and you get a divine visit? I don't think so. I can see her think, pick somebody else. That's not what she did. 
If we're going to be included in the Christmas encounter, if we're going to be included in the Christmas story as God wants every one of us included in it, we have to respond the way Mary responded. We have to respond to what seems overwhelming, what seems uh, mind-boggling, but it's of the Lord. And that's exactly what Mary did. She responds to the Lord. And she said, I am your lowly servant. Some translations say maid servant. She doesn't even classify herself as a middle-of-the-road servant. She considers herself below the average servant. As the Lord wills. As the Lord speaks. You see, we can be included. I love the fact that Nazareth was included here. And here again, just to show you the handprint of God, Nazareth, not talked about anywhere else in Scripture except for one time in one verse. And it's not even directly quoted, but it's hinted at because God has a plan. Look at his plan. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Here come forth the rod from the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. You know that Nazareth translates branch. The correlation between Nazareth and the branch that grow out of his root, where the branch came from, came from Nazareth, up out of Nazareth. Even though the only other, there's no direct mention here and only mention of it as the name Nazareth, the town Nazareth, is only mentioned as what good thing can come out of it. And yet, here in Scripture, in Isaiah, just like uh, Mary was included in in Genesis 3, just like she was included over in Isaiah's prophecy before to be the virgin, she and the town of Nazareth are once again included in scriptural prophecy, even though they might not have realized it at that moment in time, she is brought in. The branch has, the sprout has come forth. The branch is coming forth out of Nazareth. And thence Jesus becomes Jesus of Nazareth. Yes, he was born in Bethlehem, but his lineage, his root here, that's where he went back to live then eventually. And uh, so we see that taking place and unfolding. So here's Mary. She's finding her place in God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 says this, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, there are few of you who are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. If you keep reading down through this passage, it basically says, yeah, the world doesn't see it coming. And let me just say this today. You might be sitting here and you might not see it coming. But God has a plan. And Christmas punctuates the fact that God will fulfill his purposes. The question is not whether we're going to be in the story. The question is whether we will be obedient in the story. Whether we will respond to God in the, his call for us to respond to him and his will, whether we will adopt the attitude that Mary had, who considered herself nothing and the lowest of people, and yet she was willing. She was willing to be used to the Lord. Here's what it says in Scripture. I love these words from Mary. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 46, it says, And Mary responded, O oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Now, if you are of a mindset in here and you're looking at all the problems, the world stage is nasty. Your personal circumstances have just gotten more complex. You're going to break the news to your fiance. You're going to break the news to your parents. You're going to break the news to the religious leaders and nobody's going to want to believe you. And yet Mary says, oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me 
bless it. You see what happens? When we say yes to the working of God, we get included into the plan of God. We become an instrument and a tool. We didn't make any of it happen. Mary didn't make the baby. God did that. Mary didn't get herself from Nazareth to Bethlehem to down to Egypt to back to Nazareth. He, he, she didn't do that. God did that. Mary didn't provide for him that wise men came. We'll look at them in a few weeks. But that wasn't even them. It was God did that. What is God doing in your life? Even now, as we approach Christmas, and where the hand of God is actively at work, you may think he's silent, but he's not inactive. And one of these moments, and one of these days, he's going to speak. And may every one of our responses be like that of Mary. Oh, Lord, yes, however you want to use my life however you want to go, however you want to work. I won't discount the circumstances, but I will rather recognize your grace that abounds within me and that I have gotten to be included. And the truth of the matter is everyone in this room is included. Now we can all breathe a sigh of relief because there's no Messiah to be born. He's done. He's here. He's come. He's done the work. But his work is continuing. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it's continuing. You're included in that. Will you say yes? Luke 1, 34 says, Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that a baby will be born, will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. I cannot for a moment fathom the challenge this was for Mary. Just a simple young lady growing up to try to wrap her head around. How is this possible? And he speaks. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you said come true about me come true. And then the angel left her. What's God speaking into your life? What's he showing you today? How is he working? How are you being included into the Christmas message to the world that needs to see men and women rise up and say yes. He does reveal himself in very powerful ways. We see that he gave her a sign, but he also said the sign is for the world. I'll give you a sign. A virgin shall be with child. That's a pretty significant sign because it's not doable by man. He told Mary, hey, this is, mind you, it's before Facebook, Twitter, and everything else. He told Mary that Elizabeth was with child. Otherwise, Elizabeth would have posted this all over Facebook with little pictures, right? But that wasn't the time period. We didn't have the U.S. Postal Service. And we certainly didn't have the Internet to spread the news like that. But the angel of the Lord said, hey, you're going to find this out, so I'm just going to tell you right now as an affirmation that I'm at work. What I speak to you is true. You see, God asked a lot of Mary because her pain and suffering would not end just in that challenging period where she has to kind of convince people and she couldn't convince them. I bet you there were people till the day Jesus rose from the grave that thought, I know a Joseph was a fool to believe her. This Jesus guy, look at this. Look at all the, I bet you he's on the cross because of her sin. But if you don't think people thought that way, you don't know people very well. So I believe up until the ascension of Jesus Christ, Mary bore a lot of shame. And there were skeptics at the family dinner table who said, there's no way. Why? They're right. Scientifically, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But when you cut God out of the equation, then nothing's possible again. 
except for what we can control. But the, the point of the story of Christmas is what we control fails. What man tries to do on his own fails. But what God controls, which is the story of Christmas, the message of redemption, that succeeds because he doesn't need us, but he desires to include us. So God gave her incredible strength right up to watching her son flogged, crowned with thorns, and nailed to the cross. He gave her incredible strength and grace to walk through this. And Scripture often mentions Mary in her heart pondering these things as things unfolded in Jesus' life. And she watched it, observed them. I want to close today with a prayer for us as the body of believers. And I want to specifically ask if you're here today and you're trying to figure out what's God doing in my life, I want to specifically ask you to consider this. God is at work. Even if you can't see it in your own eyes, even if it's seemingly bad things are unfolding, God is at work. You say, well, that's the big picture here. It's Mary was included because the Messiah had to come, and that's how God did it. That's a big picture there. Who, who am I? Yeah, well, that's what Mary thought. Who am I? I'm from Nazareth. God is at work in your life. And even the ugly that's happening in the world around about you can be God shifting things. Again, by the time Paul shares the message of Jesus Christ all over the world, it's shared in Greek. Why? Because of a 400-year period of silence where God was still actively working. How's he working in your life? And will you let him work? Will you say yes, yes, God, to whatever he wants to do in your life and through your life? And you may even be here one step further, and I'm going to pray. You may even be here and say, I don't even have any idea what God wants to do. Just wait upon the Lord. Be faithful and wait upon the Lord. He will do His will. The only thing I want to make sure is when He asks of me anything, I say yes in obedience to the Lord. And then I'm included. And He's working things. You see, sometimes we think we're cut out. The truth of the matter, we're being hewn into that spiritual household. He's the chief cornerstone. And we are living stones being built into that. And God's niching and carving the right spot to place us at the right time. He did it with Mary. We'll look at a different focus with Joseph. But you'll look at each of the five characters we'll look at. And every single one of them were included in a very unique way. And their role was very unique as each, each of our roles, yet put together in obedience. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Let's stand together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for us as the body of believers that your grace might abound to us, that you might guide us, that you might direct us. And even as I pray, Lord, I pray specifically for those in the room today that they're just pondering. They're, they're trying to figure out where life is headed, what's going on, where they should go, how they should react. For some, they have details. You have spoken to them in some way, but they're just not sure what to do with what you've told them. For others, they haven't heard your voice, and they're just waiting, and they feel like in the waiting time that they're insignificant, and where they're at in life is insignificant, but there's nothing insignificant. You are working in all of our lives, both for your glory and for our good, and for the good of those around us. And Lord, I want to thank you for that. As we approach Christmas, I want to thank you for your grace that includes the opportunity that whosoever will call upon your name can be saved. And I want to thank you for the fact that when we're saved, that's not the end of the journey. It's just a beginning of a new leg of the journey for us. And that you continue to speak, and you continue to minister, and you continue to work in each of our lives. I pause in this prayer and ask everyone to keep their heads bowed and just say, are there those in the room today who would say, Pastor, I'm actually struggling with where my purpose is in life. I don't know where I fit. And this has been something that's on my heart heavily. 
and I just feel like I'm just existing and not making a difference, and I don't even know what to do. Pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up if you're in that situation? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Father, for those who have lifted their hands, and for all of us, but especially for those who have lifted their hands, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you will do it. Because you're faithful and just to complete in us that which you've begun in us. Lord, bless these individuals in a special way. And may you strengthen them as they wait to hear your directive and your voice in their life. Help them to be able to look back on this season in which they thought they were floundering and see the hand of God impress all around them shaping, molding, and preparing them for the work that you have. And Lord, help them and all of us say yes whenever you speak and guide us and direct us that we might be a part of the beauty of the greater plan of God in sharing the gospel, the good news with the world around us. I thank you for that. We celebrate your grace in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.